Hello and welcome to this Deakin University alumni webinar with presenter Stuart Thompson. Sam Johnson here from the Deakin Alumni Relations team. It's great to have you with us. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which we're broadcasting today, the Wadwurrung people of the Kulin Nations, and to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Today we are broadcasting from Deakin's Geelong Waterfront Campus and our webinar topic is, is saving one life just as important as saving many? the tension between humanitarian response and high level influencing. To watch past webinar and seminar recordings, visit the webinar and resources page on the Deakin Alumni website. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted online and will be available in approximately three weeks under the Arts and Education section of the page. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter. With over 20 years in international development sector, working in organisations such as Oxfam, World Vision and Greenpeace, Deakin alumnus Stuart Thompson brings experience, leadership and passion to every organisation he works in. He's lived in and worked in remote developing communities and sat as an observer to the EU and UN. In Australia, he played a senior leadership role in the startup and establishment of the National Disability Insurance Scheme and Stuart is, is currently the Executive Director of the Good Business Foundation. With the unique background of extensive NGO and government experience, Stuart's strength lies in strong community development practice, as well as advocacy and campaigns strategy. Combined with his bent for creative communications and monitoring, evaluation and learning, he is known for the ability to drive innovative and strategic solutions for practical and tangible outcomes. Thank you so much for joining us, Stuart. Pleasure. Over to you. Well, thank you, Sam, um, and thanks for inviting me along, everyone. Um, it's a real privilege and an honour as a Deakin alumni to be speaking with you today um, about my years of experience working in the international development sector. Um, and in fact, this last just this past weekend, um, I caught up with a number of my um, friends from the from the days of studying at Deakin University in Burwood. Um, we have a friendship group that's lasted nearly over 25 years now and we catch up at least every few months um, to to either catch up at each other's houses or at a, at a restaurant. Um, many of us have kids now and, and we're getting a bit more grey haired so um, it's a really great thing to be a part of an alumni and a, and a group of people that come together um, and share in our work, in our personal lives so it's a real, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as um, Sam said today, um, my title, my speech is entitled "Is Saving One Life Just as Important as Saving Many?" Um, a big, a bigger question, and a, I guess a philosophical question that has um, one for the ages, really. Um, I, I'm not intending today to solve that question or to answer that question. And there's plenty of um, philosophical arguments, deontologies, utilitarian arguments for um, approaches to that. Um, and all of those things come in um, as a mix in the work as a development professional working overseas. But really probably what the main theme of today will be about is the tension you play with um, as a humanitarian um, or a development worker working overseas. Um, it's not a comfortable space to be in, but it's a very purposeful space to be in. Um, and I'm very lucky to have been able to work in this space for, for quite a number of years. Um, so just one thing I wanted to talk about uh, before I get into the work uh, aspects of the of the pre uh, presentation today is um, a little bit about um, myself um, and the journey so far and where I've where I've come to uh, in my personal and my professional work. Um, this is a photo of my um, of my prep and grade one class um, at the Sunnycliffs Primary School, which is up near uh, Mildura in the states north. Um, uh, the school itself has uh, had, um, unfortunately it's been shut down now, but um, had 45 students in, in the whole school um, and so we had combined classes. Um, and for those who don't know me, which I presume most of you, I'm the snowy haired white guy sitting behind the chalkboard right at the front uh, with a big smile on his face. Um, I was very lucky to be a part of that school and, um, and that community, a, a typical country um, community with um, with yeah, really good um, families that we had a great support and friendship with. Um, I'm one of four children. Um, I'm the second born and um, coming from a really strong and stable family as well. But 
Um, well, I should also mention the, the, the girl sitting next to me in the chalkboard, apparently I married her in, in prep as well, the, the, uh, amongst the um, orange orchards, um, but she moved into state, so anyway, that ended there. Um, but anyway, um, you know, the challenges ahead for me and really were brought to me as well for this young snowy head white guy sitting at the front of the class was that um, I had a learning disability growing up. Um, it took me many years to uh, to learn how to read, um, to write, and to do maths. Um, and in fact, now I'm not even today. I'm not such a great reader. Um, so what it meant for a person in those days, before the days of the NDIS and um, early intervention, and um, you know, you basically were called names that you wouldn't um, expect to be called today. Um, but luckily, like I said, I had an amazing community and family around me. Um, um, I had a group of mothers who even then then spent time learning about different types of learning disabilities. Um, and sitting with me uh, it, during class times to help me through the day. My dad would spend an hour with me before I went to school to prepare me for the day, and my mum would spend about three hours with me after school um, to keep me uh, up to speed and ready for the next day. But whilst they were a great support, um, they weren't always there. So what it meant was that, you know, there was a guy, a pretty young guy with, you know, a great learning disabilities, not really understanding what's on the page in front of him. But luckily, given the support I had, um, you know, I could go across to a classmate, um, I could walk up to the teacher and I could ask them questions and I could find out what they're doing. Um, and often this wasn't in just, you know, what is the answer to that question? It was more creative ways like, oh, what did you get to in that answer? And oh, that was interesting. I was thinking the similar thing. So you find different ways of communicating with people um, to, to, to get through life. Um, but what that time for me really instilled in me was, I guess, as I've said before, the first thing is that is the communication um, with anyone. I, I haven't been and I'm not afraid really to speak with anyone. At the same time, I'm not um, unused to the feeling of nervousness when trying to speak with people. Even today, you know, preparing for this talk, um, you know, I feel I need to be um, prepared and well um, versed in what I'm going to say. But at the same time, though, I have this underlying um, feeling that I've been here before and I can, I've got this. So communication is a strength from that, those days. Um, also, this uh, incredible work ethic that I um, have maintained from able to do an hour's worth of work in the morning school and work after school um, to keep me going had really instilled in me uh, a great work ethic and a way to organise my life uh, well so that it equipped me for both personal and professional, um, I guess, achievements through my life. Um, and it showed that, you know, by the time I got to university, um, the way I organised myself and the work ethic I had really meant more than the, um, I guess, the, the natural intelligence, uh, academic intelligence that might be out there. Um, this, the third thing I get, this, uh, I guess, is that because I was so used to be able to talk to anyone, I can talk to anyone. Um, so I've been a, as an observer to the UN. Um, I've sat in some pretty interesting places, um, and I've whilst felt, you know, not always um, fully confident, I felt always part that I can talk to either a prime minister, a president, or even a community worker out in um, a community I've never been before. So um, the communication and the ability and the fearless, fearlessness to be able to talk to people, along with the strong work ethic, has really come from my days of growing up in a small country town in the northern part of the state with a learning disability. So um, on to the work now, though. Um, basically, the work that I the work that I do, um, and people ask me, you know, what is it to be a community development worker? Well, there's this quote here that um, came to me once when I was studying at actually Melbourne University, of course, and um, it was a, an architectural uh, article, so it wasn't even related to development work, but it really, for me, stood out to be what it is to be a development worker. Um, the quote, building is viewed as a process, not only a product. The process is a dance of constant negotiations, at the end, the trace of the dance is seen in the building. In this process, the architect leads a complex collaboration that folds culture, place, and people into a new relationship with each other, affecting transformation. So working as a development worker is, is really all about that. Um, it's sitting in that space between, and it's an uncomfortable space often. It's not within your own culture or your own being, but it's not within the culture and the place that, that you're, you're working within. Um, as some people say, being culturally relative. Um, it's really trying to find a way to bridge those two places and to, to affect a positive outcome in the end, or as um, a good mentor to me once at least caused no damage, which is um, which would be good for a, a, a white man such as me who's currently doing, <laughs> had currently has previously been responsible for all kinds of ills in the world. So um, 
you know that is really important to have that that, that sitting in between. As the as the Swedes say, you need to have ice in your stomach when you're doing your, this type of work. Um, one thing I would like to say about this is some people um, often say to me, oh, but isn't it all about the community? And it is all about the community. You know, they want to, um, it's really their, their lives and their, their futures that they're working on. But it's important as a development worker in that space between to be upfront about your background, your culture and your priorities. Um, a clear example of that has been in issues of gender. So, you know, my worldview and the view of the, the organisation I've worked for is that it should be equal relationships and there should be equity for all people um, and we should work towards that. It's not just a, an ideal to be had, but we actually believe it's good for community and good for, for development. Um, and so for many, so for a number of communities I've worked in, um, you know, patriarchy is quite strong still, um, and that the priority for having gender equality, for example, isn't always been the one that's been top of mind. Um, but I've had to be upfront about that and to say, if we're going to work with this community, these are some of the principles that we need to work towards. Now, the realization of those of, of how that is done is really the, the work of the community with you to figure that out. But at least to be upfront and to talk about things. The big, some of the biggest mistakes I've seen made is people come into a community and think, oh, it's all about the community, but they, they're they bringing their own agendas and they're bringing their own culture and they have to be clear with that with the people they're working with. So this is a very crude, um, I guess, diagram I've put together of the, the pointy end of development or international development organisations. Some people call them the silos, which is not necessarily more, most productive, um, but often they are quite siloed pieces of work. There's obviously lots of other uh, work that goes within uh, international development organisations um, that are incredibly important from the, fu the fundraising, supporter engagement, um, and all kinds of things. But these are the sort of, this is sort of the work that um, goes on um, out in the field or, or within the work in international um, bodies such as the UN or the EU. Firstly, you have the humanitarian response and early recovery work, which is which is what most people see on TV. You know, it's the, the times where people um, or communities are under great stress, um, either through slow onset or acute onset disasters, through war, famine, uh, and so on. Um, and that's, uh, you know, the, the priority there is to, to save lives, keep people alive and keep people safe. But they also have a component of early recovery, which is which leads into a longer term, um, I guess, development approach. And the second part is long term community programs. That's where um, organisations um, and agencies commit to long term um, partnership with communities, either through helping to build infrastructure, um, capacity building and even some sort of behaviour change or even things like peace building after conflict. Um, and then you have the advocacy, advocacy and influencing work um, that happens at a local level, national level, um, global level. But really this is the area where, um, where I guess the systems and structures, um, uh, the policies, the laws, um, the financing is, is really influenced and, and addressed. Um, and, and, um, and so that's where that work goes on. Um, but this is a. But really, what I, I'm going to talk to you today again is about the tension between these three areas and how I have worked within these three areas to bring them together. And this quote, which is a, a Maasai pro proverb, which says, "If you walk, want to walk fast, walk alone. But if you want to walk far, walk together." Um, now, this is this is very very true for this this work. Um, you know, you can walk very fast if you're a humanitarian response or a long-term development in isolation. But once you start working with others. Um, in a more complex web of interactions between local, national, global actors um, across communities and so on, it does create complexity and, and it creates greater, um, uh, you know, things that you need to address so that doesn't things don't um, slow down to a halt, but that they, um, uh, you know, that they are consolidated and work well. So, really, if you do this well, you'll walk um, further, um, but you might not walk walk faster together. So the first example I want to bring to you today is the example of my time working with um, with World Vision and um, their campaign or the program of work they called Child Health Now. Child Health Now um, is uh, was a, a program of work that basically combined their programmatic work, the work of long-term development, their health programs, humanitarian response and advocacy work um, to influence um, countries improving or focusing on Millennium Development Goals 4 and 5, which were the ones focused on um, on maternal and child health outcomes. So really what it was about is um, 
at World Vision was was get, uh, gathering a whole lot of data from our local programs or humanitarian response, mm. working at national and um, global forums to um, to influence um, the, the the frameworks and the funding that would go to those communities for for support. Now, um, and this is no criticism of those country officers or those uh, country governments, but what we found that we went at national at, at global forums such as the World Health Assembly countries were coming and presenting and saying they're making great progress towards um, Millennium Development Goals 4 and 5. Um, and whilst we didn't dispute that, on, on average, um, they were probably pretty correct that they were making great strides in, in improving. And for those people who know, we have made great improvements over the last 30 or 40 years in, in um, some of these, these indicators. But our feeling was from World Vision, working in the poorest communities, that the most marginalised um, uh, communities, um, most remote communities weren't receiving the services and weren't having their health improved. So what we did is we gathered data from our local programs and sort of said, you may be correct on a, on a national scale, but at a local level in some of these communities, uh, we're not seeing that change as we call it, they can't feel it. Um, so that really brought to bear um, our advocacy work and what it meant was um, Every one of our programs in the community level could see the value that we're creating at the global level because funding was coming back down to the local level for support for their programs, um, often through government mechanisms. Um, and the same with the humanitarian response, their voices were heard um, and real change and real policies were being changed um, through those uh, situations. Um, the second, um, I guess, um, example I want to give around this is the work I did with Oxfam that I was part of their was helping support their Grow campaign. There was a similar type of setup of World Vision, but Oxfam, uh, whilst very similar to World Vision, um, doesn't have as, as, as much global reach into the community. They work through a, per, part, a very much a partnership, local partnership model. Um, and so it means that the data collection can be a little bit more challenging, but where Oxfam is quite strong is in their work around high level influencing and also around their research agenda. So. We partnered with universities um, and we did research inside our, our program areas that would then translate up to a um, up to a global or regional level to affect change. Um, partnership partnering with universities gave us credibility, and of course, working with real researchers with with good discipline helped us um, in in you know presenting our case well inside some some pretty um, serious forums. But really what this was about, in both cases, was about gathering information, gathering data from community level in an organised way um, that could uh, benefit our work and also show benefit to each other. But um, whilst a, a development is a, sometimes can be a systematic and process driven um, an accountability or, um, process, uh, it's not always that way. And in fact, you have to be open to opportunity. Um, and so this quote, they say timing is is everything, but then they say there is never a perfect time for anything. Um, this comes, this example that I'm going to give you comes from my early days working as a campaigner and an ocean expert for um, Ox, uh, sorry for Greenpeace in Greenpeace Nordic, which is um, a collection of country offices, um, Finland, Norway, uh, Sweden, and Denmark, uh, called Greenpeace Nordic. When I was living in Sweden. Um, basically, um, I had written a campaign proposal to the board of um, Greenpeace Nordic that they should consider focusing on the Baltic Sea. Um, having studied environmental science um, after my work, my studies at Deakin, um, I um, basically felt that the Baltic Sea was under threat. Um, the Baltic Sea, um, for many of you who don't know, is a brackish in inland water body. It's, it's, it's a sea, but it's really largely enclosed um, except for a small strait. It has its own special ecosystems and habitats. Um, and having lived in, and worked on that coastline, um, I felt that this is a place that needed to be protected um, against three major threats, really. First of all, overfishing. Um, there's a number of states that border the Baltic Sea. Uh, the regulation is, is a bit patchy at times. Um, however, at that stage, um, the focus on overfishing was getting good media coverage. So we felt that one of our uh, priorities would be around overfishing. Um, and we, we took that campaign goal on um, not because we thought we were going to affect major change, but we thought um, we'd probably achieve it within the first 12 months, which, which would give the communities and the work we, we did in the campaign um, great momentum into the other more difficult questions. The second two were around marine protected areas, which were getting some, some coverage. And the third most difficult area was around um, oil and oil tankers and or people bit, um, 
I guess, um, shipping through toxic materials through the Baltic Sea. Um, and so I was getting very little um, traction on this issue, especially around oil um, and having um, uh, and having better regulations on, on shipping. Basically what I wanted for the Baltic Sea was to be classed a particularly sensitive sea area, of PSSA, which is a classification under the auspices of the IMO, which is a UN body. And at that stage, only one place in the world had that um, classification, and, it was, and that was the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So people used to laugh at me at, at different meetings and say, well, the, the Baltic Sea isn't the Great Barrier Reef, and I wasn't going to argue with that, but um, I still felt that it should have that um, classification, especially due to the, the, the toxic um, chemicals travelling through it. Um, but it was only until the prestige went down off the coast of Spain that it propelled me into a, into a place that I'd never been before and I probably had never never will go again, and that was into the global and regional limelight. I was on BBC, CNN, and a lot of um, uh, radio programs and TV programs. I was the only one really working seriously on this issue at the time um, in Northern Europe, um, and, and so I was um, in front and centre. What was great about Greenpeace, though, is they were very nimble, and they, they shifted a lot of their focus in their um, European campaigns to support me at the IMO uh, to support me at the Baltics in the Baltic Sea campaign to get um, countries on board. And within a very a few short months, except for Russia, we had all, every single Baltic Sea um, around, the uh, Baltic country around the Baltic Sea supporting our call for the, for the particularly sensitive sea area. And so it was a great pride about uh, four or five months later, sitting at the IMO when they passed the, um, the classification of the Baltic Sea being a particularly sensitive sea area, which basically meant that ships with um, poor um, history and also poor safety standards wouldn't be allowed in the country. So if any of you taking a cruise into the Baltic Sea and see the PSSA marking on the, on the maps, you'll know where it came from. So that, that's all well and good. I mean, we've had some success. We've had, um, you know, um, seas being classified as particularly sensitive sea areas. We've had, um, you know, uh, all kinds of things um, going well. But one thing that I've learned over my time is celebrating those successes is, is fantastic. Um, celebrating governments coming out in support of what you're trying to push for, supporting marginalised communities if they're being marginalised under, you know, um, the MDGs or now the SDGs was really important. But one thing I learned is that capacities of local governments and, and governments in developing countries are low um, and you need to work with them in, um, in not just getting them to admit to the problem or, um, or pass a bill or a law, but also how they may imp implement that. The example I'm going to give you here is around my work in Sri Lanka. I work with this amazing team in Sri Lanka with, with Oxfam um, in the Grow campaign. And they'd only run, ran a very, very successful campaign in getting the government to um, agree um, to their demands, which was basically around organic farming um, and small scale farming and particularly rice. Rice is a big thing in Sri Lanka, as it is in a lot of parts of Asia. And they wanted basically um, the government, which is a large purchaser of rice, to purchase the organic small-scale farming rice, which was called SRI rice, System of Rice Intensification. So in a meeting we had with the Prime Minister, he, he said to us quite clearly, well, you've sort of won the debate, you know, publicly um, I'm in support of it and so are the people around me but now you need to convince me it can actually be done because I have responsibilities to ensure that the people of Sri Lanka are fed. Um, and at this stage, you know, we're not sure that your um, system of, of rice will be enough or the, or the process of getting rice to the right places will be, will be enough. So we had to work with them, not only on the growing of the rice, but also the, the supply chains, um, showing that it was economically viable and to really work, not just at a national level, but at, at a local level. So the team went out, gave technical support to local, the local um, governments and really work with them in demonstrating that this is actually a very viable and good way of growing rice. In fact, it's, it produces more rice, far more rice than the, um, the chemical, chemical or pesticide grown rice that was more large scale. Um, and even we even, um, for, for new politicians coming into the, uh, into the parliament, we actually were allowed to have a, um, a, a rice paddy field next to parliament that they gave us that we could actually demonstrate. So when the par parliamentarians were finished for the day, we could take them across the road and show them the system of rice intensification that we were doing with small scale farmers. So they understood it um, and not just as a concept, but as a reality. 
So as I said, in showing working with people um, and working with governments, not only to pressure them into doing things, but also working to help implement is, is critical. Now, um, this quote I've always loved, and people probably know it's a Martin Luther King Jr. quote, and it says, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Um, and for those of you and for me who work in this field and can sometimes feel a little bit downtrodden, you can read that quote and think, no, we, we're, we're still there um, and we can still you know, push on with the challenges that are ahead. Um, and working within communities for many years, um, and not just communities, but also working even at the highest level, you realise that people are quite emotional. You know, I can talk about having an evidence-based agenda and bringing data from our programs through an organised way or conducting research. But really decisions are not only decided that way, they're decided through an emotional response to the issues that we face. Um, and it's important to know that. In communities that I've worked in, they've had a very strong spiritual base for their work um, and their decisions. Um, artistic practice is another thing that, you know, you'll go to a performance and you'll think that's just a performance for entertainment, but really it's about, um, you know, rituals and rites um, and, and how things are done within the community. So to engage in artistic practice, in emotion, um, and in, in the way things um, are done spiritually or, or through, um, through an emotive lens, or people would say an irrational lens, is, is a critical part to, uh, to, um, to the development work that you do. Um, as someone said once to me, it's better to be uh, compassionate than right, and sometimes that's exactly right. You need to be able to balance out the times where you need to push uh, people into places that um, are, are more rational and other times we need to work with them where they are at, which can be very emotional, especially after crises, especially after um, tragic events and, and work with them on that. So I, I kind of want to finish um, today on a, a little bit of a, a photo of my three little children. Um, this is taken a couple of months ago. Uh, my youngest now is four months old. Um, and by the way, as you saw the snowy haired guy at the front, my wife is Tanzanian, that's hence they get those nice um, locks. Um, so three little children and having kids for me has really, uh, I guess, connected me to future generations and issues into the future. Um, as I said previously, for, friend, for people who are fans of, of facts, um, Hans Rosling, the book on factfulness is a great book and many people are reading it. Um, uh, Bill, Bill, Bill Gates thinks it's the book of our time to read and it shows that it's true we have made incredible progress and we should be very proud of the work um, that's been done in local communities uh, and national uh, level to really improve some of the some of the basic outcomes for, for people in um, some pretty difficult places but we still have some some challenges ahead and for me the two challenges that I think we face into the future generations are of course, climate change and how we respond to that, how we respond both through um, what we do now to alleviate the impact of climate change, but also how we work with preparedness for communities that will be impacted by climate change that's already happening. But probably more important, importantly, and only looking at my social media feed last night, I, um, or earlier this morning, I could see the, uh, the feed coming through around Boris Johnson's um, election as PM for, um, for the UK. You know, it's very polarised. We sit in our echo chambers and we and we support each other's views. And whilst I'll admit, I'll put myself out there that I'm not much of a fan of Boris Johnson or Donald Trump and, and the work they're doing and the things they say, um, it's incredibly important as development workers um, to treat every single person, even if you've seen them do the most horrible things, which I have unfortunately had to have seen, to treat every person with the respect and the human rights that they deserve. Um, the only way in the future, uh, I think, for a, a community, a global community to come together is to break down the polarisation we're seeing um, on our social media feeds, in our media channels, and even our general community and politics and so on. So working as a community development worker, sitting in that really uncomfortable space, as I said, space between people maybe you don't want to work with, is some of the most important work you'll do as a development worker, because sitting inside your own patch, inside your own group of people and just agreeing with each other is not getting us anywhere. So, as I said, I'll, I'll finish where I, where I started. Um, sit in the space between, I uh, feel that uncomfortable tension between the different places and, uh, and understand who you are and what you're doing in that place and work with it. Um, always never get too far ahead of yourself and thinking you know the right answer but also be confident in the principles you have around human rights um, and, and dignity for people. Um, 
I'd like to thank thank you all for the um, for the ability to and the opportunity to come and talk to you today, and I'm looking forward to hearing any questions you might have. Thanks. Thanks so much, Stuart, for such an insightful presentation. <clears throat> So we've got plenty of time for a good discussion session now, which is great. Um, now's the time for attendees to write any questions you might have into the questions box on your screen and submit. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so I had one that I was thinking of while we were um, while I was listening to you speak, and we'll, um, maybe I'll ask that before as some more questions come through. Just interested to know how you decide between a local or immediate solution to a perceived problem. Um, or a high level sort of influencing solution? And maybe if you had an example of sure. that. Yeah, um, so it's never an easy answer to that question, but um, I, I guess for me, the thing that um, it's always come back in my work is you have to be able to show a practical outcome for people. Um, and that's really what it's about. Um, you know, one of the things um, I met, I've been working most recently in East Timor and um, I met with Janana Gusmao and he, he said to me that He's sick of people coming to do walk, uh, workshops and talk fests um, at, at his, uh, at, at, you know, in workshop, you know, the, the meeting rooms of his of his country. He wants to see um, people doing something, uh, and so um, to be able to do something, uh, whether it be affecting, um, uh, you know, a policy change or whether it be delivering direct um, aid, is an important step into a communities. Communities then wait, listen uh, more to, and they, they believe you're there with them and for them. You're not just coming there to chat with them. A simple example, I'll give you one simple example um, with this is that um, I was working in East Africa, very naive, first time coming down. To, so I've made plenty of mistakes in my time, of course. And this was, I was going down to work with a, a network of um, NGOs in that area. Basically, um, we were looking at um, human rights, uh, sort of education for communities, basically getting communities to be more engaged with their their um, local uh, governments and demanding more services because services were coming. Services were coming um, down to local level, but the community weren't demanding them and the local governments were saying, oh, you know, all these things aren't, communities aren't coming to get them. So we're trying to, to get communities to demand more services from their governments. Every time I'd go around to this education with the communities, I'd always have this group of mothers at the end come up and sort of say, oh, thanks so much for the workshop, that was really great. Um, but my, my son here, I haven't got any soap. Can you give us some soap so I can, we can have some soap for washing our children with? And I used to think, oh, you know, I'm not here to talk about soap, I'm here to talk about human rights, I'm here to talk about you know, how people engage with their governments. But after a while, I realised that I had to make it really tangible and practical for people. So we started up a campaign there called Sabuni, which is the name for soap in Swahili. And basically, the same education happened, but we worked on a targeted approach to ensure that communities, or especially these mothers, were demanding for um, soap um, and basic necessities for those people who were most vulnerable to be delivered to them. And so when they saw the benefit for that, when they saw the benefit of actually achieving that, it, it helped then in um, future discussions because they were seeing the, the practical benefit of what they were getting out of it. Great. Yeah. Cool. Uh, thank you. So we've had a few more questions come through. Um, Alicia asks, how do you deal with the times you feel helpless or beaten down? Is it self-talk, reminders, doing something other than work, etc.? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and it's very important for um, self-care. Um, in this work, you think you'd be selfless and so on. And, and I've made that mistake, probably burning out a couple of times in my life, um, damaging relationships and so on. So it's really very important. Um, and I hope people don't sort of um, follow the, some of the same mistakes I've had in my life. But uh, how to deal with that? Well, you know, I think it's being aware of um, situations you're in, um, being uh, confident and um, to talk with your people that you work for. For example, if you're working for an organisation, to talk to your managers to say, look, I think I need to have a break. Um, some organisations, in fact, most organisations are pretty good with allowing people for respite and time time away from some, some very intense work they do. Um, some people, though, don't take those advantages and they burn themselves out. Um, I've had uh, mentors through my time. Um, these have only come really to me through uh, my personal professional work. Um, uh, through just meeting people and deciding that I think they're good people that are probably you know 20 years ahead of me and I can and, and I can ask them questions and a lot of that has been around um, self-care, being able to manage yourself, um, be good, to, uh, be a good parent to your family, 
and so on. Um, I guess the only other thing as well is that if it's any consolation, it gets it, it gets better at time. You get better at um, knowing how to, I guess, compartmentalise um, the work you do. Um, so when you come home to your kids, that you're not bringing your work home with you. Um, in the beginning, it can be all encompassing and very emotional, like I said. Um, and whilst there's many types of self care out there, um, which you should take advantage of, um, it's only a matter of, of experience that really leads you down the path of um, knowing that this is what's matter, this is what's important, mm -hmm. that it's important not to bring your work home um, and expect that your family can understand everything you've seen during the day. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you. And it also answers the next question from Kelsey, I think, when she was asking about how. You balance family life with international work. Do you feel like there's anything else you'd add to that, or? Well, um, I mean, it, it is a difficult one. International development work requires people travelling. Um, I mean, the big, just a personal thing for me is that for myself and my wife, um, she's Tanzanian, um, so she understands the context I'm working in a lot of the time. But for me, for example, I went back to gender. Um, I, I want her to work. Um, I want me to work, um, and so it takes quite a lot of work. You know, so there's been times where. My wife has just said, oh, it's okay, I'll stay at home with the kids and you just work. And I felt, no, that's not, I mean, I'm living a life, not just in my professional life, but my personal life of how I want to be in the world. And so it is difficult. It takes lots of work and don't worry, we, every single night you're talking about how to balance those things out. Um, but again, it, international development organisations are pretty good. Um, they're pretty good at um, allowing for part-time work. Um, if you've travelled too much to take a bit of time off to not travel as much. Um, and so it's really also you have to take a lot of responsibility yourself to really decide what sort of person you want to be um, and really talk about that with your managers and workplace about how you want to live your life. Because if you just get sucked into the vortex of international development work, which happens, I've got plenty of friends who are still out there just travelling from one place to the other and they, they, ha they seem to be happily doing that and that's fine, but it wasn't the life I wanted to live. Not, not so conducive to... Not good for kids, yeah. no. Yeah. Right, thank you. Um, Kelsey had another question which was um, sort of looking back on how, wanting to know how you got into the international development yeah. field. I was thinking about this before I came here today because this is the probably the most common question I get and it's a very important question. Um, and I'm not, I don't think I've got much of a useful answer for you because I started this work, you know, over 20 years ago. Um, and then really what happened to me is I backpacked into Africa and I um, found myself in Zimbabwe and I found myself in a local NGO. And I walked up and said, can I please volunteer here? And I volunteered and, and got enough experience. And one thing led to the other through just volunteering for quite a number of years and living you know, quite poorly, let's put it that way, um, but still having great, gaining great experience. Um, but having now been in, the, been in the senior management role in some of these bigger organisations, I can say the talent out there, the education that people have these days is incredible. Um, so you shouldn't take... Um, if you don't get the, the first job you get, all I can say is try again because there's, it's a very talented group of people vying for many more limited jobs these days because of um, certain reasons around funding and, um, and jobs quite rightly moving overseas. Um, but if you can, and you should, get involved. Um, volunteer, um, do whatever you can to show your edge above the next candidate because really this is what makes the difference. When you see someone with a great education, um, great grades, um, they present really well. Um, if they've been volunteering or they've been had a, a long-standing volunteerism into certain areas, that's what stands them above often. And often their referees have come through that way as well. So you have people that you know that can referee for them and tell them about how good they are. Um, and that also helps. Great. Yep. Thanks. Um, and now we've got a bit more time for questions, so please do send those questions through. Just um, type it into the questions field on your screen there and hit submit. Um, we've got a few more to get through, and this is going really. It's been really good to hear your thoughts to it. So I just wanted to update as far as the uh, makeup of our audience today. We had around 35% of health and development professionals, 45% students. So lots of people interested to hear that what you were just talking about, so thank you, and um, other interested people around 20%. So. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, there was a comment from Anna who says, not a question but a comment, as the mother of children with learning difficulties, mm -hmm. congratulations on harnessing the dif discomfort and complexity of your own learning differences in such a remarkable way. Well, thank you. Um, and it's a, it's a tough one. Um, uh, you know, I'm not saying that... Um, I can look back now and say, well, what, wasn't that amazing? The, the strength that it gave me, the fearlessness that it's given me to, to do the work I do. I mean, I've done four university degrees now. 
um, including a master's. Um, and so it's possible, but it, it's hard. So I don't want to sway away from that. The three hours every day after school with my mum and dad, the mornings um, and the setbacks, it, it's, it's incredibly hard. But it does, it does, it said in the end, um, add a new dimension. Um, you know, my brothers and sisters, they're quite um, recluse. They don't like doing public speaking. Um, they're quite quiet. Um, they've always been good academically at school, um, but I'm luckily here sitting here in front of you today because of that, I believe, because of that experience. Mm. So keep going. Great. Uh, a question from Mark, sort of two questions. Firstly, he asks, um, I'll, I'll read the whole thing out and then see how it goes. So what is your view about whether Australia should increase foreign aid? And he goes on to say, also, do you have a view about aid being redistributed for what could be seen as non-aid purposes, for example, soft power responses to um, China's presence in the Pacific? Huh. Um, well, uh, big, it's a big question. Uh, of course, simply, yes, people, Australia is way behind in its aid giving. There's no doubt about that. Um, I remember coming back, I was working for a Swedish agency um, in Sweden. They were giving 1% of GDP, and I think they're above that now still. Um, and when I came back to Australia um, to work for World Vision, um, I remember one of the senior ma managers at World Vision saying, it's incredible the government's committed to 0.5% of GDP. Um, and I remember openly in that forum saying, that's terrible. Like, how can we celebrate that? But now we're <laughs> even way further down the track than that. So, um, so the simple answer is that, yes, they should, but it's not the whole picture. I mean, one thing I've learned about um, working in overseas aid and development is it, aid is an important um, lever in the work we do, but it's not the only thing, especially as we become more multipolar. You mentioned China. I mean, it's not the, sim the same world that we've had before. Um, there are certain uh, tensions militarily. There are certain tensions in the way people spend their so, the money on, on aid and development in certain areas. Um, and so you, the, the approach that needs to be taken now is a lot a lot different through the way we do trade, the way we um, share, I guess, resources and so on across a, a global world. Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm just starting a new foundation called the Good Business Foundation, which is a very exciting new idea. It's a, it's a brand new area for me. I've worked in government. I've worked a long time in non-government. Now I'm working in the corporate world. Um, and really, it's the idea of the, non, uh, the, the Good Business Foundation has come around data that's coming out around that um, doing good is not just good um, for doing good, but it's good also for business. Uh, it retains staff, it attracts high, highly talented staff to your business, um, it makes people want to buy your products. And, and so there's a role for, for, I guess, the private sector now, not only just because you know, we've had this for many years, talking about the triple bottom line and doing good, um, and honestly, it doesn't seem to have had great traction. But now that there's data coming out showing that you can actually make money out of doing good, um, people are starting to listen. So we're hoping to harness that momentum um, and to get businesses more involved in, in giving um, and, and not just giving because to make money, but also because it engages their staff. It, it makes their workplace more purposeful. It wants people, makes people want to come and give their talent and time to their organisations and businesses. So. Um, it's a big question you've asked. I don't think I've answered it very well, um, but it's probably worth a, a whole new discussion around that. Yeah, Certainly. Um, we do have a little bit more time, so if anyone's been sitting on a question, please do send it through now. Um, if, I'll just give you um, a little moment. Um, oh, Mark says thanks, so I think you might have answered <laughs> okay. that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose a bit more time for you if you feel that um, yeah. if you feel there's anything you haven't discuss that you'd like to sort of get across? Or... I guess for those people who are interested in getting, getting back to that question, are interested in getting to certain um, areas of development, um, there is a question now around um, where, where, where people want to work. So, so the, I guess the, so the, some of the big emerging areas where um, people in Australia, if you want to be based in Australia, um, can, can add value is through the, um, the monitoring, evaluation, the learning agendas. Um, having a distance to a community can be helpful. You have to have a, a reasonable understanding of how to engage with the community, but being able to do, um, to help establish monitoring and evaluation processes um, can be done through uh, more remotely remote work, and it's sometimes better done that way because you're not so invested in the project. You can be a bit more objective. So that's a, a definitely a growing um, area. I've seen a lot of my former colleagues moving into that space. Um, and the other areas around, uh, I guess, support engagement, which is sort of where um, I am at the moment, but also where I've been uh, when I was working as the CEO for East Timor Hearts Fund. Um, really, I was working about how to engage the Australian community more in um, 
in the work. And that's not just about fundraising anymore. Before, when I first started, it was really, you know, you give us some money, we'll give the community money. But now with, you know, social media and people be able to connect with each other, um, you know, you have to be much more um, savvy around how you work with people in Australia and how you engage with them. I have to say that the the good news is that I believe the um, mum and dad donors out there who used to be thinking, oh, aren't we saving poor Johnny in that country have changed. They understand that you need to um, support communities as well. You need to support um, agendas around changing policy um, and behaviour. And um, so I believe that the, the donor demographic is shifting as well, which is um, which has been good. So supporter engagement isn't just fundraising anymore. It's a, it's a lot about helping people understand the global dynamics that are out there and how we can best be a player in that space. Yeah. Great. Had a couple more questions coming through. One from Lauren asking, in the context of development and international aid, do you have any tips for communicating with those who may have a different perspective as you talking about before, for example, Trump supporters? Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, that's, it's never easy. Um, uh, so I've worked across all kinds of places. I've worked with people I have honestly not liked at all, but I've found a way to communicate with them. Probably the first step in is this, I find there's always a, a connection uh, with people in some form or another, um, whether it be their family, uh, their personal interests. Um, and there's always something that you find, in, as I said before, you know, you, uh, when I first started out in this work, I, I, had, I thought I was going to find the bad people in the world. And I just find them. And we've got, but I haven't found those people. People are just people. And we're, we have the ability to do amazingly good things and amazingly terrible things to each other. Um, and so to find that commonality with people in that first conversation so they know that you're seeing them as a person um, is really, really important because then they, they relax and they think, oh, well, I can talk to you about this. Um, it's not to say that you will agree with them, and I think that's important also to respectfully disagree with people when you don't agree with them. I've come across people with very different views that I've had to... Um, you know, be quite clear with them, I don't agree with them. But at the same time, you know, like I said, there's other parts of their lives that are, uh, are very similar to mine and they have they still want to be loved and they still want to love people. Um, and so the people that you've, I've met in my life that I could say are truly bad are very few. Um, the majority of people are uh, maybe just from a place that hasn't had the same sort of upbringing or education or maybe they're fearful about certain things. And so... Um, so there's always a place to work from, but to find a common spot is probably the best place. I wouldn't start out by arguing because mm -hmm. that sets people straight away off on the wrong track. Um, but to try and find that first conversation, uh, some commonality about them and about you, and you, often you find it. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can talk about that for a bit. And then when you start getting into the more serious issues, you see each other as people. So you don't address the elephant straight away? No, not straight away. <laughs> Leave that elephant alone for, for, for a bit yeah. and then so you know each other a bit more. And that's great. That's really good to hear. Thank you. And um, kind of leads well into this other question from Molly. She asks, um, how do you deliver development successfully amongst the violence and corruption that um, may exist in many poverty stricken um, kind of areas? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think the um, violence and corruption in my belief is a lot less than what people beat up to be. I think in this part of the world, people um, like to use it perhaps as an excuse for not supporting certain causes or you know the money's not going to get there or so on um that's not to say there isn't corruption there is um, in systems that are not quite robust still for accountability there is there are leaks and there are people that take advantages of that um, and like i said for themselves they see it as, as, as a um, a real and i've got plenty of examples where i've had conversations where you could say it's been corrupt practice but at the end of it you think oh this person was actually trying to do the right thing <laughs> but um, it wasn't really the best way of doing it. So it, it is a tough one. Um, sometimes we've, there's organisations um, had to basically do deliver, say for example, World Vision deliver aid um, in parallel to government um, and not through government. Um, that was obviously not an ideal. It's only a temporary situation while you wait for things to stabilise. And normally you can be pretty clear with governments about this. I mean, people at a national level, for example, they understand the conflict may be going in a region of their country. And you can say, look, at the moment, let's just have, let's have our people handle this for the moment. But let's have a process over time of capacity to help you build your structures up so that you can have good accountability for the things going in and out. Um, so there's, there are ways around it, but at the end of the day, it is a tricky one because... Um, controlling the supply chain. I mean, you even see this in business, um, businesses trying to control their supply chains and ensure there's no slavery in their supply chains. Um, companies commit to that uh, idea. Um, many try and do a really good 
thing. I saw sort of Cotton on in the, in the paper recently. Um, they're obviously, I think, trying their best for these types of things. I like to believe they've got a great foundation, but it's really difficult. So you've got to continue. I guess you've got to continue to be uh, mindful and vigilant about these things, um, and never just think, oh, you know. And this is what I have to say. This is probably one of the big things about development I've learned over time is we're all we're good people doing this work. We mean to do good things, but we can't just expect everyone else around us doing it as well. So you've got to be um, quite careful the way you approach things. Um, especially around finances. Um, as you say, never trust any, anyone with finance and including myself, you know, everybody, everyone should be held accountable for what they're doing with the money. Um, and there should be, that should be set up from the outset. Um, and so having those sort of expectations, um, um, not because we don't think people are doing good within our community programs, but that this is the way it is because we need to ensure that um, things are done the best for the, the greatest impact for the community. Then that's, um, that's set up up front. There's not much of a thing to debate really. Right. Well, um, I think that will sort of um, wrap up our question and answer section. So thank you so much for your time, Stuart, thank for you. all the insights. Um, really appreciate it. I've got a few um, little slides on to go through before we finish, so we'll just turn off the... Uh, okay. So um, just a couple of reminders for alumni who have tuned in. Please do follow us on social media. We've got a presence on Facebook and LinkedIn. Great way to keep in touch with us and um, to hear about events and webinars such as this one. So please do have a look. Um, a reminder as well that we offer 15% uh, off postgraduate course fees for Deakin alumni and immediate family members. So if this, you're thinking of going back to study or if your uh, family member is, please do um, have a look on the website or you can get in touch with us, um, deaconalumni at deacon.edu.au for more info. We run a number of competitions. We've got some great ones going at the moment and um, you can find out more about those by staying in touch with us. We send out a monthly newsletter, um, Deacon Times. So if you don't receive that, please do email deaconalumni at deacon.edu.au with your contact details. We'll update your information on the system and you'll get that um, email. With all that information, also we um, talk about these competitions on social media too, so please check them out. And more broadly, we'd love to um, have uh, your contact information on our um, database so that we can contact you about events that are happening in your area. So we need um, postal information for that. Um, email, we can get in touch about webinars and that kind of thing as well. So a um, couple of things you can do there. Um, you can visit engage.deacon.edu.au and update your details or email our shared inbox. So we'd love to hear from you. Thanks once again, Stuart. Thank you. And have a great day.